tells from the future, I will give birth to you, my angel. From the book by Vladimir Magra, The New Civilization, Part 1, translated by Susan Downing. Victor Chado, entrepreneur, awoke at dawn. Beside him on the, on the wide bed, his young lover was sweetly sleeping. The coverlet's thin fabric hugged her sculptured feminine figure. Whenever they appeared together at a banquet or in a hotel at a fashionable resort, her figure would attract men, sometimes envious, sometimes lascivious gaze. Inga, that was the sleeping beauty's name. Inga also had an enchanting smile and impressed those around her as an intelligent, erudite woman. Victor liked spending time with her, which is why he bought himself a second floor room apartment, outfitted it with ultra-modern furniture, gave Inga the keys, and he'd sometimes spend a night or two with her there. When his intensive business permitted, he was grateful to this 25-year-old woman for those magnificent nights and for her company. But he had no plans to marry her. He didn't feel any particular love for Inga. And he also knew he was 38 and she was 25. Naturally, a few more years would pass and this young woman would want a younger lover and with her looks and her brains, that wouldn't be difficult. And she'd find herself someone young and even wealthier. And it would all be thanks to him. Because by marrying her, he'd be giving her entry into the circle of influential businessmen. Anger turned toward him, smiling in her sleep. And the coverlet slid partially revealing her alluring, perfectly formed breasts. But Victor Shadow didn't feel aroused the way he usually did. When he glimpsed her half-naked body, he carefully pulled the coverlet up over the sleeping Inga, quietly so he wouldn't wake her. He got up and went to the kitchen. He made some coffee and drank it. He lit a cigarette and as if lost in thought, began pacing back and forth across the spacious Eden kitchen. That dream, the unusual dream he'd had during the night had disturbed his feelings. Yes, his feelings, not his thoughts. Victor dreamed that he was walking along a shady path, intensely analyzing the feasibility of his latest commercial deal. His bodyguards, whose presence annoyed him and prevented him from concentrating fully, were walking in front of and behind him. The continual noise of cars rushing along on the other side of the park fence also made it hard for him to get his thoughts together. Then suddenly, the bodyguards vanish and the noise of the cars faded. And he heard the singing of birds and saw how beautiful the spring foliage on the trees along the path and the flowering bushes were. He stopped, delighting in the serene feelings that had arisen within him and he felt better than ever before in his life. And then he caught sight of a little boy running along a path toward him from far away. The sunlight illuminated, illuminated the boy from behind, 
creating a halo around him. So it looked as if a little angel was running toward him along the path. And the next instant, it dawned on him, running toward him was his little son. The boy was running toward him, working his little arms and legs hard. Victor crouched down and threw his arms open wide in joyful anticipation of an embrace. And his little son threw his little arms open as he ran too. Then suddenly, once he ran to within about three meters of Victor, the little one stopped running. The smile faded on the child's face and the serious expression on the child's eyes made Victor's heart beat more powerfully. Well, come on, come on. Come to me, come here. I'll give you a hug, little son. Smiling sadly, the little one answered. You won't be able to do that, Papa. Why not, the Victor astonished? Because, the little one answered. His voice fell with sadness. You can't hug me, Papa. Because you can't hug a son who's not been born. And you haven't given birth to me, Papa. Well, then you come here and give me a hug, son. Come here. It's impossible to hug a father who hasn't given birth to you. The little one tried his best to smile through his tears. But a single teardrop rolled slowly down his ruddy little cheek. Then the child turned and headed slowly and heavily off along the path, hanging his head. Victor remained kneeling, lacking the strength to move from the spot. The child was leaving, and the inner pleasant and serene feeling was leaving along with him. The war of the car of the war of the crowd of the cards began to grow once more. As if from far away, Victor couldn't move and he couldn't speak. But with his last ounce of strength, he shouted, Don't go, son. Where are you going? The child turned and Victor saw a second tear begin to fall. I'm headed for nowhere, Papa for an endless nowhere. The little one cast down his eyes and was quiet. And then he added, Papa, I'm sad. But because I haven't been born, I can't help you be reborn through me. Hanging his head, the little angel receded from him. And before long, he had disappeared as if he dissolved in the rays of the sun. The dream ended, but the memory, memory of the wonderful serene sensation remained. They assumed to be urging, urging, urging him to take some kind of action. Victor finished smoking his third cigarette put it out with a, sh with a sharp and decisive motion, then went into the bedroom saying loudly as he went, wake up, Inga, wake up. Oh, I'm already awake. I've just been lying here. Luxurating and wondering where you've gotten to, responded the beauty, lying there on the bed. Inga, I want you to have a baby. Could you bear me a son? Throwing back the sheet, she jumped off the bed. She ran up to him, wrapped her arms around his neck, pressed her beautiful, lift body to him, and whispered passionately. The 
the nicest, most beautiful way a man can declare his love is to ask a woman to bear his child. Thank you, if you're not kidding, that is. I'm not kidding, he replied firmly. Slipping on her robe, Enga replied, Well then, if you're not kidding, if you're serious, if so, then this is a spur-of-the-moment decision. You haven't thought it through. First of all, I want my future child to have a father in his life. But you're married, my dear, my beloved. I'll get a divorce, Victor said. Even though he'd actually already been divorced for three months, he just hadn't told Inga about it for a whole number of reasons. Get a divorce, and then we'll talk about a baby. But I'll tell you right now, Victor, even if you do get a divorce, that still won't be the right time to talk about children. First of all, I still need a year to finish grad school. Second, I'm already so sick of school that once I do finish, I like to have a year or two to fool around, hang out at resorts, enjoy myself. But a baby, if I have kids, that'll be the end of that. Inga argued, half choking, half serious. Victor cut off her objections. Fine, I was choking. I have to go. I have an important meeting. I've already ordered the car. See you later. He left, but he wasn't going to a meeting, and he hadn't ordered any car. Victor walked slowly along the sidewalk, scrutinizing the woman, hurrying in his direction. He looked at them in a new, unfamiliar way that surprised even him. He was trying to pick out a woman who would be worthy of bearing him a son. A woman he'd want to have a baby with. All the stylish made up girls who used to attract him were out of the running right away. He totally would reject all the half naked ones and mini skirts or the ones wearing tight clothes showing off their figures. I know why they do that. I know what's on their mind, and they're trying to look smart, too, he noted to himself. They're using a variety of baits to attract the guys, and they'll see who bites, and they bite. Sure they do, just not because they want to have children. A male would take that bait, but a parent won't. Go ahead, shake your butts you little fools, but there's no way a little wagtail like you bear my son. Two two girls who happened to be coming toward him just then were smoking as they walked, and one was holding an open bottle of beer. And those two, they're not at all fit for childbearing. Only an idiot would want to have a baby with them. Victor also noticed that very few of the women and girls coming his way were totally healthy. Some were stoop over and judging by some others' facial expressions, they must have stomach problems. Still others showed clear signs of obesity or anorexia. No, you can't have children with women like these. Victor thought to himself, man, I'm sure every single one of these women dreams of having a prince roll up to her in a white Mercedes, but they can't do the most basic thing for that prince. They can't give birth to a healthy child if they're not so healthy themselves. Instead of calling his driver, Victor took a trolley bus to his office and the whole way There, he scrutinized the woman he saw, trying to identify who from among them might be worthy to bear his son, but in vain. As the day progressed, 
even as he sat alone in his office during his lunch break. He didn't stop thinking about the woman who would bear his child. Every once he had the feeling that it was as if he was choosing a woman who would give birth to him himself. Finally, he came to the conclusion that he wouldn't be able to find the ideal mother for his son. He'd have to create her. To do that, he need to find a more or less healthy young woman of good character who was nice looking or at least not repulsive and create the right conditions for her to get all possible training and shore up her health at all the best spas. But the key would be to send her to study at the best possible school where she could receive information about how to prepare for pregnancy and how to go through pregnancy, where she could learn about childbirth and early childhood education. At the end of the workday, Victor called Valentina Petrovona into his office. She was the firm's lawyer and a woman with a wisdom born of rich life experience. He asked her to take a seat and begin a roundabout way. I have somewhat unusual question for you, Valentina Petrovna. It's well personal question, but it's of the utmost importance to me. A certain relative of mine asked me to find out. Well, you get She's planning to get married and wants to have a child. She asked me to find out where in our country there's a good school where she could learn the best way to carry a child during pregnancy, about childbirth and about raising him once he's born. And what does the father need to do? Valentina Petrovna heard him out attentively and after a short silence said, as you know, Victor Nikovich, I have two children, and I've always been interested in the literature about childbirth and raising children, but I've never even heard of there being any such school, whether here in our country or abroad. That's strange. They teach people everything, but no one touches on this question. This most important question not in the schools or in post-secondary schools. Why not? Yes, it's strange, agreed Valentina Petrovna. Somehow I've never given that any thoughts. But now this state of things seems strange to me. It seems that the Duma does discuss the question of teaching about sexual relations, relations in the school but they don't consider the question of teaching people the right way to bear and raise children. So that means every couple is forced to experiment on their own child. So it seems they have no experiment. Of course, there are all sorts of classes where expectant parents learn what to do during labor and how to interact with a newborn. But since there is no scientific basis for what they teach, it's practically impossible to determine which classes really do help and which do more harm than good. Valentina Petronova answer. What about you, Valentina Petronova? Did you take any of those classes? I decided to have my younger daughter at home in the bathtub with a midwife's help. A lot of people do, the, do that these days. People think it's more comfortable for the child to come into the world at home in the presence of his relatives. They say a newborn can sense when people are acting lovingly toward him and when they're indifferent 
as often happens in maternity wards. It's like a conveyor belt there, you know? Victor didn't feel encouraged by his conversation with Val Valentino Petrino over there. In fact, it had the opposite effect. It depressed him. For two weeks, he spent all his free time outside of work considering the problem of giving birth to children. For two weeks, whenever he was walking through the city, whenever he went to fancy restaurants, bars, and theaters, he kept looking at women's faces, evaluating them. He even took a trip out to the village, but he didn't find anyone suitable for himself there either. One day he drove his Jeep with the tented windows over to the teacher's college and looked through the window at the girls walking by. At the three hours of this, he turned his attention to a young woman who'd come out. Onto the porch, a brunette, a brunette with a short but tight braid, an elegant figure, and it seemed to him an intelligent face. As she passed by the jeep on her way to the bus stop, Victor lowered the window and called out to her. Young lady, excuse me. I've been waiting for a friend here and he hasn't shown up. Might you be able to show me the best way to get downtown? And then I could drop you off at home if you'd like? She took in the Jeep with a glance and answered calmly. Why ever not? I'll show you. When she gotten into the back seat and they'd introduced themselves, Lucia pointed to Victor's pack of cigarettes and said, Those are good cigarettes. Might I have one? Of course, go ahead. Victor answered, and he was happy to hear his cell phone ring. It was nothing important, but as soon as he hung up, Victor made a worried face and informed Lucia, who was greedily taking a drag on the cigarette. Plans have changed. I have to get right to a business meeting. Please forgive me. He let smoking Lucia out of the car. He decided he wouldn't let his son be poisoned by smoke. Victor didn't meet with his lover at all during these two weeks, and he didn't call her. He decided that if she didn't want to have his baby, if all she wanted to do was enjoy herself and hang out at fashionable resorts, then he didn't need her. Of course, it was exceedingly pleasant spending time with her. She was beautiful and smart, but now he made some serious change in his life plans. I'll give her the apartment. After all, this woman has adorned my life for a while. Victor decided he had he headed for that university where Inga studied, planning to give her his set of keys. On his way, he called her on her cell phone. Hi, Inga. Hi, a familiar voice answered. Where are you now? I'm just about to your university. Will you be done soon? I haven't been to school for 10 days, and it looks like I won't be going back there in the foreseeable future. Did something happen? Yes. Where are you now? At, at home. When Victor opened the door with his key and walked into the apartment, Inga was lying on the bed in her robe, reading some kind of book. She glanced at Victor. There's coffee and sandwiches in the kitchen, she said, without getting up, and then went back to her reading. Victor made his way to the kitchen, took a couple sips of coffee, had a cigarette, and put his keys on the table. 
then went to the bedroom door and announced to Inga, who was still reading, I'm leaving maybe for a long time or even forever. I'm leaving you the apartment. Goodbye. Be free. Be happy. And he headed for the exit. Inga caught up with him right by the door. Now hold on, you jerk, she said, although not maliciously, tugging at Victor's sleeve. So you're leaving? You've turned my whole life upside down, and now it's goodbye? How did I turn your life upside down? Victor asked in amazement. I had a good time with you, and I don't think you mind being with me either. Now you have your own apartment and plenty of outfits. Live your life, enjoy yourself the way you want it. Or do you want some money too? You really are a jerk. You really, you really cut me to the quick. An apartment, outfits, enjoy yourself? <laughs> Whatever, don't make a scene. I've got important business. Goodbye. Victor to took hold of the doorknob, but Inga held him back, yet again seizing his hand. No, sweetheart, wait. Please tell me. You asked me to have your baby, didn't you? Yes, I asked you and you said no. At first I said no, then I spent two days thinking about it, and I agreed. I quit grad school, gave up smoking, I've been exercising every morning, and then I came across these books about life, about children, and I can't put them down. I'm studying the best way to give birth. And he's all, goodbye. But you're the one... But you're the only one I can imagine as the father of our. When he realized what he'd heard, Victor impulsively hugged Inga, repeating over and over in a muffled whisper, Inga, Inga. Then he picked her up in his arms and carried her into the bedroom, carefully as if she was the greatest treasure. He laid her on the bed and hurried to get undressed. More passionately than ever before, he embraced Inga as she lay on the bed and began kissing her breasts, her shoulders, while trying to remove her robe. But Inga suddenly offered silent resistance and began pushing him away. Settle down, please. This is not what's important. To make a long story short, we won't be having any sex today or tomorrow or in, or in a month. Either, Inga informed him. What do you mean, no sex? But didn't you just agree to have my baby? Yes, I did. So how are we going to have a baby if we don't have sex? The sex has to be entirely different. Fundamentally different. What do you mean? Just what I said. Now tell me, sweetheart. You loving future papa. Why do you want your child to come into the world? What do you mean, he asks, sitting down on the bed in disbelief. Everyone knows why, and there's only one way to make it happen. Yes, that makes sense, but humor me here. Let's be clear about what you want and which alternative you're choosing. Do you want your child to be born as a consequence, as a side effect of your or rather our pleasure of the flesh? Or do you want him to be the fruit of our love, the fruit we consciously wish for? I think a child would find it unpleasant to be a side effect. So you want him to be the fruit of our love. But Victor, you're not in love with me, of course. You like me, but that's not love, not yet. Yes, Inga, I like you very much, you see, and I like you very much too, but that's not love, not yet. We need to earn each other's love. I imagine you've been reading something strange. 
having new anger. Love is a feeling that comes up all on its own from who knows where. And it vanishes who knows where. You can earn someone respect, but their love. But that's exactly what we have to do. Earn each other's love. And our son will help us do that. Our son. Do you have a feeling we're going to have a son? Why do you say going to? He already exists. What do you mean he exists? Victor said jumping up. You mean you're already pregnant? Ah, uh, so you were hiding it from me? And whose is he? How far along are you? He's yours and I'm not any time along at all. So he doesn't exist yet. Oh, he exists. Listen, Inga. I don't understand a word you're saying. You're saying some weird things. Can you explain this to me more clearly? I'll try, Sir Victor. You wanted to have a child. And you've been thinking about him. That I wanted to have a child too. And I've been thinking about him too. Now, it's a known fact that human thoughts are matter. And that means that if we imagine a child in our thoughts, then he already exists. So where is he right now? I don't know. Maybe in some other dimensions we don't know about. Maybe he's in some other galaxy in the universe, running barefoot amongst the stars and looking at the blue earth. Well, he'll take material form. Maybe at this very moment, he's choosing well he'll be born and under what conditions. And maybe he wants to let us know that somehow, don't you hear him or feel him axing? Victor looked at Inga wide-eyed as if seeing her for the first time. Never before had she discussed anything this way. He couldn't tell whether she was joking or serious, but the phrase may be, at this very moment, he's choosing, he's choosing where he'll be born, made him stop and think. Babies are born in all kinds of places. Sometimes they are born on a plane or a ship, or in a car. Many are born in maternity wards, and some at home, in bathtubs. They're born where they end up being born, but where would children want to be born? Take him, Victor. If he'd been able to choose, where would he have wanted to be born? In Russia or in the best maternity ward in England? say, or in America, but none of these options particularly appeal to him. Inga interrupted Victor's musings. I have a clear plan of how we need to jointly prepare for our meeting with our son. What kind of plan? Listen carefully, sweetheart. Inga spoke decisively, more decisively than ever, than she ever had before. Now sitting in the easy chair, Now walking around the room, the first thing we have to do is to bring our physical condition into perfect order. From now on, we won't smoke or consume alcohol. We'll do a body cleanse beginning with the kidneys and livers, using infusions and fasting. I've already chosen a program. From this moment on, we'll drink only spring water. That's very important. I've already been getting daily deliveries of five little bottles of spring water. True, doing it that way is twice as expensive as going to the store, but that's okay. We can manage it. 
We need to do a physical workout every day so our muscles will grow stronger and our blood will flow through our veins more forcefully. And we also need fresh air and positive emotions, which are harder to come by. Victor liked Inga's decisiveness, and without even waiting for her to finish laying out her plan, he announced, we'll buy the best workout machines and have the best masseurs come by. I'll send one of my drivers out every day to pick up the spring water, and I'll send a different driver out to the forest every day to collect air. He can use a compressor to pump it into tanks under pressure, and then we can let it out in the apartment little by little. The only thing I don't know is where we can get or buy positive emotion. Maybe we should go to some good resorts, the way people go on honeymoon trips. Yes, definitely like on honeymoons.